This is an audio recording of The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells, narrated by Right Here Audio. Chapter 5. The Burglary at the Vicarage The facts of the burglary at the vicarage came to us chiefly through the medium of the vicar and his wife. It occurred in the small hours of Whit Monday, the day devoted in Iping to the club festivities. Mrs. Bunting, it seems, woke up suddenly in the stillness that comes before the dawn, with the strong impression that the door of their bedroom had opened and closed. She did not arouse her husband at first, but sat up in bed listening. She then distinctly heard the pad, pad, pad of bare feet coming out of the adjoining dressing room and walking along the passage towards the staircase. As soon as she felt assured of this, she aroused the Reverend Mr. Bunting as quietly as possible. He did not strike a light, but putting on his spectacles, her dressing gown, and his bath slippers, he went out onto the landing to listen. He heard quite distinctly a fumbling going on at his study desk downstairs, and then a violent sneeze. At that, he returned to his bedroom armed himself with the most obvious weapon, the poker, and descended the staircase as noiselessly as possible. Mrs. Bunting came out on the landing. The hour was about four, and the ultimate darkness of the night was past. There was a faint shimmer of light in the hall, but the study doorway yawned impenetrably black. Everything was still except the faint creaking of the stairs, under Mr. Bunting's tread, and the slight movements in the study. Then something snapped, the drawer was opened, and there was a rustle of papers. Then came an imprecation, and a match was struck, and the study was flooded with yellow light. Mr. Bunting was now in the hall, and through the crack of the door he could see the desk and the open drawer and a candle burning on the desk, but the robber he could not see. He stood there in the hall, undecided what to do, and Mrs. Bunting, her face white and intent, crept slowly downstairs after him. One thing kept Mr. Bunting's courage, the persuasion that this burglar was a resident in the village. They heard the chink of money and realized that the robber had found the housekeeping reserve of gold, two pounds ten in half sovereigns altogether. At that sound, Mr. Bunting was nerved to abrupt action. Gripping the poker firmly, he rushed into the room, closely followed by Mrs. Bunting. Surrender, cried Mr. Bunting fiercely, and then stooped amazed. Apparently, the room was perfectly empty. Yet their conviction that they had, that very moment, heard somebody moving in the room had amounted to a certainty. For half a minute, perhaps, they stood gaping. Then, Mrs. Bunting went across the room and looked behind the screen, while Mr. Bunting, by a kindred impulse, peered under the desk. Then, Mrs. Bunting turned back the window curtains, and Mr. Bunting looked up the chimney and probed it with the poker. Then, Mrs. Bunting scrutinized the waste paper basket and Mr. Bunting opened the lid of the coal scuttle. Then they came to a stop and stood with eyes interrogating each other. I could have sworn, said Mr. Bunting. The candle, said Mr. Bunting. Who lit the candle? The drawer, said Mrs. Bunting, and the money's gone. She went hastily to the doorway. Of all the strange occurrences, there was a violent sneeze in the passage. They rushed out. As they did so, the kitchen door slammed. Bring the candle, said Mr. Bunting, and led the way. They both heard a sound of bolts being hastily shot back. As he opened the kitchen door, he saw through the scullery that the back door was just opening, and the faint light 
of early dawn displayed the dark masses of the garden beyond. He is certain that nothing went out of the door. It opened, stood open for a moment, and then closed with a slam. As it did so, the candle Mrs. Bunting was carrying from the study flickered and flared. It was a minute more before they entered the kitchen. The place was empty. They refastened the back door, examined the kitchen, pantry, and scullery thoroughly, and at last went down into the cellar. There was not a soul to be found in the house, search as they would. Daylight found the vicar and his wife, a quaintly costumed little couple, still marveling about on their own ground floor by the unnecessary light of a guttering candle. Chapter 6 The Furniture That Went Mad Now it happened that in the early hours of Whit Monday, before Millie was hunted out for the day, Mr. Hall and Mrs. Hall both rose and went noiselessly down into the cellar. Their business there was of a private nature, and had something to do with the specific gravity of their beer. They had hardly entered the cellar when Mrs. Hall found she had forgotten to bring down a bottle of sarsaparilla from their joint room. As she was the expert and principal operator in this affair, Hall very properly went upstairs for it. On the landing, he was surprised to see that the stranger's door was ajar. He went into his own room and found the bottle as he had been directed. But, returning with the bottle, he noticed that the bolts from the front door had been shot back, that the door was in fact simply on the latch, and with a flash of inspiration, he connected this with the stranger's room upstairs and the suggestions of Mr. Teddy Henfrey. He distinctly remembered holding the candle while Mrs. Hall shot these bolts overnight. At the sight, he stopped, gaping. Then, with the bottle still in his hand, went upstairs again. He rapped at the stranger's door. There was no answer. He rapped again, then pushed the door wide open and entered. It was as he expected. The bed, the room also, was empty. And what was stranger, even to his heavy intelligence, on the bedroom chair and along the rail of the bed were scattered the garments, the only garments so far as he knew, and the bandages of their guest. His big slouch hat even was cocked jauntily over the bedpost. As Hall stood there, he heard his wife's voice coming out of the depth of the cellar, with that rapid telescoping of the syllables and interrogative cocking up of the final words to a high note, by which the West Sussex villager is wont to indicate a brisk impatience. George, you got what I want? At that, he turned and hurried down to her. Janny, he said over the rail of the cellar steps, tells the truth what Humphrey says is not in his room, he ain't, and the front door is unbolted. At first, Mrs. Hall did not understand, and as soon as she did, she resolved to see the empty room for herself. Hall, still holding the bottle, went first. If he ain't there, he said, his clothes are. And what's he doing without his clothes then? Tis a most curious business. As they came up the cellar steps, they both, it was afterwards, ascertained, fancied, they heard the front door open and shut. But seeing it closed, and nothing there, neither said a word to the other about it at the time. Mrs. Hall passed her husband in the passage and ran on first upstairs. Someone sneezed on the staircase. Hall, following six steps behind, thought that he heard her sneeze. She, going first, was under the impression that Hall was sneezing. She flung open the door and stood regarding the room. Of all the curious, she said. She heard a sniff close behind her head, as it seemed, and turning, was surprised to see Hall, a dozen feet off on the topmost stair. But in another moment, he was beside her, 
She bent forward and put her hand on the pillow and then under the clothes. Cold, she said. He's been up this hour or more. And she did so. A most extraordinary thing happened. The bedclothes gathered themselves together, leapt up suddenly into a sort of peak, and then jumped headlong over the bottom rail. It was exactly as if a hand had clutched them in the center and flung them aside. Immediately after, the stranger's hat hopped off the bedpost, described a whirling flight in the air through the better part of a circle, and then dashed straight at Mrs. Hall's face. Then, as swiftly came the sponge from the washstand, and then the chair, flinging the stranger's coat and trousers carelessly aside, and laughing dryly in a voice singularly like the stranger's, turned itself up with its four legs at Mrs. Hall, seemed to take aim at her for a moment, and charged at her. She screamed and turned, and then the chair legs came gently but firmly against her back and impelled her and Hall out of the room. The door slammed violently and was locked. The chair and bed seemed to be executing a dance of triumph for a moment, and then abruptly everything was still. Mrs. Hall was left almost in a fainting condition in Mr. Hall's arms on the landing. It was with the greatest difficulty that Mr. Hall and Millie, who had been roused by her scream of alarm, succeeded in getting her downstairs and applying the restoratives customary in such cases. "'Test spirits,' said Mrs. Hall. "'I know test spirits. I've read in papers of them. Tables and chairs leaping and dancing. Take a drop more, Janny, said Hall. "'Twill steady ye. Lock him out, said Mrs. Hall. Don't let him come in again. I half guessed. I might have known. With them goggling eyes and bandaged head and never going to church of a Sunday. And all they bottles, more than it's right for anyone to have. He's put the spirits into the furniture. My good old furniture. Twas in that very chair my poor dear mother used to sit when I was a little girl. To think it should rise up against me now. Just a drop more, Janny, said Hall. Your nerves is all upset. They sent Millie across the street, through the golden five o'clock sunshine, to rouse up Mr. Sandy Waters, the blacksmith. Mr. Hall's compliments and the furniture upstairs was behaving most extraordinary. Would Mr. Waters come around? He was a knowing man, was Mr. Waters and very resourceful. He took quite a grave view of the case. Armed, armed, if that ain't witchcraft, was the view of Mr. Sandy Wadgers. You want horseshoes for such gentry as he. He came round, greatly concerned. They wanted him to lead the way upstairs to the room, but he didn't seem to be in any hurry. He preferred to talk in the passage. Over the way, Huckster's apprentice came out and began taking down the shutters of the tobacco window. He was called over to join the discussion. Mr. Huckster naturally followed over in the course of a few minutes. The Anglo-Saxon genius for parliamentary government asserted itself. There was a great deal of talk and no decisive action. Let's have the facts first insisted Mr. Sandy Waters. Let's be sure we be acting perfectly right in bustin' that there door open. A door on bust is always open to bustin', but ye can't on bust a door once you've busted in. And suddenly, the most wonderfully the door of the room upstairs opened of its own accord. And as they looked up in amazement, they saw descending the stairs the muffled figure of the stranger staring more blackly and blankly than ever with those unreasonably large blue glass eyes of his. He came down stifly and slowly, staring all the time. He walked across the passage staring, then stopped. Look there, he said, and their eyes followed the direction of his gloved finger and saw a bottle of sarsaparilla hard by the cellar door.
Then he entered the parlor and suddenly, swiftly, viciously slammed the door in their faces. Not a word was spoken until the last echoes of the slam had died away. They stared at one another. Well, if that don't lick everything, said Mr. Rogers, and left the alternative unsaid. I'd go in and ask him about it, said Wagers to Mr. Hall. I'd demand an explanation. It took some time to bring the landlady's husband up to that pitch. At last he rapped, opened the door, and got as far as, excuse me. Go to the devil, said the stranger in a tremendous voice, and shut that door after you. So that brief interview terminated. <laughs>